Now, beyond arguments of competition and the level playing field, net neutrality is essential to keep the internet open there. And beyond economic interest, there is also a very important public interest to safeguard. Um, current practices by telecom and internet service providers, such as blocking and throttling of free competing services, are problematic enough. But we also have to imagine what kind of a um, slippery slope this could lead to. If it is okay now to block or throttle access to competing services, what could that mean if internet service providers also have new services and would be blocking access to competing new services? What would that mean for access to information uh, of all of our citizens? Last year, Marietje and I were involved in drafting a Parliament resolution on the revision of the international telecommunication regulations. Back then, concerns were growing over proposals being presented by different states and on ITU level, which would impact the Internet's architecture, operations, content security, business relations, Internet governance, and in some cases, the free flow of information online. Finally, the Parliament called on the EU member states to prevent any changes to the international telecommunication regulations, which would be harmful to the openness of the Internet and net neutrality. It's clear to me that many Europeans expect protection, protection against some commercial tactics. And that is exactly the EU safeguard <coughs> we will be providing, a safeguard for every European on every device on every network, a guarantee of access to the full and open internet without any blocking or throttling of competing services. And those are the proposals I will be putting forward to the College of Commissioners, and that's about delivering the best deal for citizens. First of all, please understand there is no data explosion on the internet. Cisco's latest estimate is the fixed internet is growing year on year 21%. That is below its historic growth figure. Mobile internet, allegedly 68%. Cisco forecasts have always been uh, exaggerated on that. They, they brought, it in, uh, brought it down substantially. Uh, and in fact, uh, uh, before the European Parliament, Scott Marcus from VIC, the, uh, the consultancy in Bonn, uh, talked about the fact that there's so much handoff from mobile to fixed networks that actually that number's coming down very, very fast. Safe business models based on guaranteed revenue from rich online services are bad for investment, and so in the long term, they're also bad for the access provider. Investment will be harmed unless net neutrality legislation saves access providers from themselves. So my message is that we should smile at the dinosaurs and not be afraid of the evolution of the internet. Let's say a generation earlier, when we didn't have the internet yet, when games were still sold in shops, uh, then we had actually the game, gatekeepers. This is, was the situation where actually we had large publishing companies who actually took the big part of the profits and basically left the leftovers to the developers and uh, basically controlled the market in, in, in their way through the shops. And the fact that this is not the case anymore, that today we have an open marketplace where every game developer can basically start to uh, offer its games to the end consumers, made also the European side much stronger. In transparency, informing consumers, which we've had now for three years in a telecom package, hasn't worked. Competition doesn't work because you need to uh, have either collusion or significant market power by an ISP in order to sort it out. So we need a bit more. Luckily, we have good examples. The Dutch and the Slovenians have actually transposed European law, the telecom package, properly, I think. They don't have a net neutrality law. They have net neutrality protections as part of their implementation of the telecom package. So what I'm saying is we don't need new legislation on net neutrality. We've got a basis of it at EU level. Now what we need is a very clear recommendation from the European Commission that explains to other member states how to do like the Dutch and the Slovenes have done and properly protect net neutrality in, in the laws. GSMA says that in 2011 there were 656 million subscriptions in Europe. That's more than one per person, you will have noticed. Beric says that 36% of mobile subscriptions in Europe have peer-to-peer -peer connections throttled or blocked. It may not have escaped your notice that Skype is a peer-to-peer -peer connection. So what's the total number 
of mobile subscriptions in Europe that cannot use Skype or similar VoIP services, 236 million. 236 million mobile subscriptions in Europe that, according to Berek, cannot use Skype. I think that is a significant problem that probably needs to be dealt with. What we expect from telecom operators, what we would impose to telecom operators if we had such a thing as an industrial policy, would be that when there is not enough bandwidth, they invest in more bandwidth, period. We pay them to grow the common infrastructure. That's their business model. That's our service. That's what we pay for. And if they claim that there might be a good reason to do something else, then it's all concern. It's all concern for, for, for us all. And I hear speaking about transparency for so many years. And here is something you can do as a legislator. Bring transparency on the cost of the offers. The internet and safeguarding net neutrality is not, not just important to us. We've commissioned a substantial report a few years ago by Plum Consulting, which looked at the social and economic value of, um, of maintaining net neutrality, which focused really on two things. I suppose the importance that there is no permission required to innovate, and secondly, this issue which has come up a lot on the panel about the economics of content and applications driving demand and encouraging investment in broadband networks. Economic freedoms and fundamental rights are not opposite, notably in a social <clears throat> economy perspective, as the European Union should be following Article 2 and 3 of the Treaty of the European Union. Sometime, the override, overriding role of fundamental rights has been stressed by the European judges. Uh, let's recall the Omega jurisprudence. But this is also, has also been the case for the EU legislator. See the case of Directive 9546, which was aimed to make possible to share personal data, and which is till now the Bible of protection of personal data. But it's also under threat through corporate actors, uh, through corporate censorship, when large monopolies behave in anti-competitive ways. Um, Frank LaRue, the United Nations Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Expression, in his report has underlined the fact that the internet is a window through which uh, human rights can be realized. And any restrictions on the right of individuals to freely express themselves and impart information must um, meet strict criteria under international human rights law. So maintaining the openness of this internet is the only way that human rights can actually flourish online. I think the most important things are, and I totally agree here again with the commissioner, transparency and fair, fair competition. Um, I think we, we see on the transparency side that, yes, there are problems. I mean, we should not uh, say that there are no problems with transparency. There are problems. Um, we have to improve um, the information of our customers, um, what is happening with their internet access, um, and what kind of, basically, uh, package, so to speak, they have bought, um, what kind of services they can use, and all of that. If we all hear a lot of buzzwords, we hear competition, switching, transparency, um, consumers vote with their feet, and so on. Competition is good for consumers. If there's competition in the telecoms market, that's good. Switching is good. They can vote for their feet. Transparency is good. But the real consumer issue here in that subset of the value chain um, that Telefonica was talking about is traffic management, is whether or not there is undue discrimination and restrictions on their connection. A transparent wrong is still wrong, whether it is transparent or not. And that's the most important thing for consumers. So the basic, the, the core question with regard to network neutrality is to uh, um, grant a, natural, a neutral and open environment on which pluralism is granted on the internet and through the internet. And uh, to this extent, uh, traffic measures, um, traffic management ma measures should be, um, should be uh, analyzed and, uh, and it should be assessed whether these traffic measures can uh, grant the full respect of human rights or whether they cannot. What the consumer and the citizen, if I may, are asking for is also to be sure that they can have access to the content, to the information, and not only to the service. I would like to understand why BBC is limiting their 
the availability of a play that is very good service for Europe, because we are European citizens. We are here to create the European single digital market, but we have not the same rights as citizens to have the possibility to have access to what? To content, to information. So whenever we've been talking about net neutrality here, we've heard that the internet is very complex, the value chain is very complex, and so is the um, technology. Uh, the contractual relationships between different parties in this value chain are, are very complex. But so I think the consumer group intervention, uh, both intervention, really showed that this isn't very complex. Um, it's about what consumers are, expectation, are, ex are expecting on, from their internet connections. It's about consumers having access to the services that they choose, but also for services to have access to consumers. Uh, when you talk about the human rights issue, it's about people not only being able to listen to what other people say, it's also about people finding people that want to hear what people say.